Hi, this is Travis here at Exercise Lab with another video for you guys. So I'm a doctor of physical therapy for those of you who don't know me and I post a lot of content in this channel and I'm finally at long last getting around to blood flow restriction training or also known as BFR. Um, definitely been a hot button lately. I feel like a lot of people have been talking about it more. Um, I've been using it for a while and I want to go ahead and bring that to you guys today. I'm going to try to consolidate it, give you the nuts and bolts. This is kind of think of your get started video. So maybe those of you who kind of been dabbling around with it, but you don't really know what you're doing. So I'm not going to necessarily go too deep into the weeds for those of you who are not necessarily interested in that. But at the same time, I do want to speak to you know, rehab applications as well as you know, performance enhancement. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about it, go ahead and stay tuned and we'll get started. All right, so I guess we should probably start by just talking about what BFR is. And so BFR is essentially using, you know, some sort of a device, whether that's, you know, a cuff, a strap, a wrap. Um, they have some that are, you know, rigid. They have some that are basically elastic, some that are, you know, more inflatable or pneumatic style. Um, and, and so basically what you're going to do is you're going to try to occlude the pressure, arterial pressure, really, in, in a limb specifically. So for that reason, I'm going to be talking in this video about something called limb occlusion pressure. And uh, you might also see as you're, you know, maybe reading some of this on your own arterial occlusion pressure. You know, for our purposes, they're basically the same thing. Um, because we're not really using BFR on, you know, certainly like a part of your neck, you're not going to really put it in your torso. Um, but for the most part, you're using a, a fairly thin strap. That being said, and I'll talk later about this too, you don't want a strap that's too thin. Usually they're anywhere from about two to three inches in girth. And generally speaking, and I'll give you guys a spoiler alert, wider cuffs tend to be a little bit better just because they're more comfortable. Um, but you're going to put a cuff and you're going to basically put it around your limb. I've already got this one preset for me. Now, some of you, are, this is a BFR band. This is a great kind of entry point band, and I, a lot of people don't like them because they're not as specific, but I'll just, I'll talk about, you know, all the different options later on in the video. Um, you basically plug this thing on. Now, you can certainly cinch it down. I already have it set at a level that I know is, is a good one for me. And uh, you, you slap this thing on, you do some exercise at basically a lower level of uh, resistance than you typically use, and you can still get some of the different benefits that you would get if you were to use higher loads. And so you can immediately see where that might be applicable for certain people, certain people who can't tolerate higher loads for certain reasons, and, and rehab is obviously one of them. So anybody recovering from different types of repairs, you know, whether it be an ACL repair, or sometimes even maybe a rotator cuff repair, although the shoulder, it's not maybe as robust as it's shown in the lower extremity. Um, but anybody who basically is just not going to be able to tolerate high loads, you know, somebody with knee arthritis even could be a good example. And so you pop one of these things on, you're able to train them at lower loads, but you can still get them some hypertrophy, some, you know, muscle strength that you might be able to, you know, skirt around the fact that maybe their knee doesn't tolerate those higher loads. So really cool thing in that sense. And uh, there's some pretty good research on it. Research definitely has been around a couple of decades. They started using these in Japan and, and you know, there's been emerging research more recently. And, and these days, it seems like articles are coming out monthly. And so the idea is you're basically increasing metabolites locally in this area. So normally when you do resistance training, one of the mechanisms of hypertrophy, increasing muscle size, is that you're getting all this metabolic signaling, satellite cells and things of nature that basically just indicate, hey, you know, slap some more muscle on. This guy needs to get stronger, you know, girl, whatever, because th there's been a big stress placed on that muscle. The three arms really that you should know, I'll back up for just a second here. You know, there's mechanical tension, you know, the, the load itself. There's the accumulation of those metabolites is another stimulation for growth. And then you also have this kind of neural signal that's basically another stim you know, stimulus as well. And so neuromuscular strength is kind of this idea. You're strengthening that nerve connection of, you know, brain to bicep if I'm doing a curl. And so I can get stronger as a result of that. Um, you know, basically independently of this muscle increasing size, you know, initially when I'm first doing strength training, that's actually what's mainly making my muscle stronger. The uh, muscle size gains don't tend to come till a little bit later on down the road. Uh, just FYI for those of you who are curious. But the cool thing is with BFR, you might be able to tap into some of those hypertrophy gains a little bit earlier than you would without it. And so by leaving these metabolites in the area longer, you're sort of tricking in a way your system of thinking that you're using higher loads than you really are. And so again, I'm putting this thing on my, my limb here. Again, this, this is a BFR band. And so I would put this here. And so as a result, I'm going to get this accumulation of metabolites. I'm also creating a little bit more of a hypoxic environment. I'm depriving oxygen. It's one of the things that, you know, I, I take in air through my lungs. I basically aerate my, you know, my lungs and it goes out into my arteries. My arteries take it out to my tissues and then in veins, you know, my venous system brings back that deoxygenated blood to my heart, you know, and around and around I go. And so when I'm leaving this, so I'm not allowing oxygen to come into the area as readily because I've got this strap on. And so I'm not including it completely to where I'm getting ischemic, I'm restricting it. Although there is another modality that where you do actually achieve ischemia. I'm not going to speak about that really in this video. But what I will say is that deprivation essentially of oxygen 
is potentially another signal that's going to have some of those different performance enhancement benefits. And so that's in a nutshell kind of how BFR works. Hopefully that wasn't too uh, convoluted for you. But basically, again, just think about it in a nutshell, you're leaving metabolites in an area longer than they otherwise would be. And so you're, you're creating a more favorable, maybe signaling cascade that contributes to muscle hypertrophy, again, in addition to this, this kind of hypoxic effect. So before we get too much farther into this, I want to talk about the contraindications, which is basically a fancy way of saying, you know, who shouldn't be doing this? Um, anybody who has a known, you know, blood clotting disorder, certainly anything that leads you to uh, predisposed to more blood clotting, you know, certainly somebody who has, you know, sickle cell or something of that nature might want to get checked out. Uh, anybody who has any type of, uh, you know, active cancer probably as well, if people go undergoing radiation treatments and things of that nature. Anybody who's coming off of a period of prolonged bed rest or surgery because you're going to be at potentially a higher blood clotting risk, particularly in that first like kind of two week window, uh, which is part of the reason they tell you not to get in airplanes and fly away. So I wouldn't necessarily think you're going to necessarily want to do this. There may actually be some research that shows it may actually mitigate those risks. But again, it's one of those things we just don't completely know yet. So at a bare minimum, I'd say probably run it by your physician. Just make sure everyone's okay with it. Um, you know, if you're doing your diligence and, and being on top of, you know, different things, capillary refill and some things I'm going to talk about in this video, um, you're probably pretty safe. But um, it's one of those things where, you know, when in doubt, I always say get checked out. Just make sure you're clear on that. Pregnancy, you know, again, same kind of thing, you know, increased blood volume. Anyone who has cardiac issues, you know, probably wants to get cleared on this a little bit too, because there is going to be an increased cardiac demand because of the fact you're putting this cuff on. Uh, you know, because you're occluding things, you're basically increasing blood pressure to an extent. And so if somebody already has hypertension, you know, that could be an issue. If somebody just has a weak heart to begin with, that could potentially be an issue because you're going to be increasing that stroke volume um, as a result of the increased demand from the occlusion on the limb. You know, certainly if you knew you had an aortic dissection or one that was kind of being monitored, um, you know, you don't necessarily want to be doing a lot of things that are increasing that uh, demand. Um, you're going to probably definitely want to get checked out on this as well. Anybody else who's got any types of uh, maybe even active infections. Diabetes is a contraindication with this, but that's kind of, you know, diabetes is a pretty broad term, right? You know, if you're otherwise pretty healthy and you just, you know, maybe you're pre-diabetic or just got diagnosed and uh, it's pretty well controlled, you know, is the risk really that high? No, but if you're somebody who's got advanced, you know, or poorly controlled diabetes with peripheral vascular disease and all the rest, you know, that's the person I'd say, okay, maybe this person shouldn't be doing this kind of stuff. Um, ultimately though, I think a lot of this also boils down to common sense. If you see somebody in front of you and you're like, maybe this person's not a good candidate, I'd say probably go with that. One thing you should keep in mind is as cool as this is, it's not necessarily going to be the end-all be-all. So if somebody couldn't do BFR, it's not to say you can't still get benefits of doing some of the other tried and true stuff we know that that's worked before. So this is just kind of an icing on the cake thing in some ways. I mean, it may be a little bit more than an icing on a cake, but it's not going to be a deal breaker for somebody who can't do this. So don't forget about the fact that, you know, just because this is kind of a hot new toy, um, old stuff certainly works and it probably, you know, still works even better than this in many ways. All right. So now that we've got that out of the way, you know, what are the contraindications? Who's, who's not going to be a good candidate for it? Let's just assume you've checked all the boxes off the list. You are a good candidate for it or the person you're trying to, uh, you know, help with this is a good candidate for it. Uh, where do you start? Well, a good place to start is going to be, well, obviously, what kind of band am I going to use? And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But let's talk about what's known as a limb occlusion pressure or arterial um, occlusion pressure. And that's basically how much pressure is going to be on that limb that I'm trying to target. And so what research has shown is that on the upper arm, okay, the upper extremity, you typically want to be, you know, higher up, you know, somewhere around what's known as this kind of, you know, deltoid tuberosity. Um, you know, I'll just show again this cuff because it's pretty easy to take on and off. You know, somewhere in this neck of the woods, you know, higher up tends to be better. You don't necessarily want it down here by the elbow. You put it around there, but you're going to put it, this thing at a certain pressure. And that's known as your limb occlusion pressure. And, you know, same thing with the leg. You know, in the, in the case of the leg, you're going to typically put this thing on and you'd put it on, you know, fairly high up, you know, pretty close to the groin if you can get it there below your greater trochanter, essentially, which is kind of that hip bone you can sort of feel on the side here because there's not really a lot of muscle on top. If you feel the hip bone, you, know, you want to get fairly close to that vicinity. Obviously, take comfort in consideration as well. If you're using a pneumatic cuff, which are these, you know, inflatable kind I'm going to show you later, um, you typically want to put those bladders on the inside, you know, portion to kind of make sure you're getting the most bang for your buck. Um, whereas it doesn't really matter as much if you're using more of these, you know, elastic, or, this is an elastic one, but if you're using elastic or a rigid um, cuff, so that's where you're going to put this thing on. And then the question you're going to ask yourself is, well, how, how do I know how much to put? Now, if you're fortunate enough to have a pneumatic one that already kind of can guide you through it, there's an app with these cuffs. These are the smart cuffs, and it kind of takes you through the process. It, it's a little more of a no-brainer kind of plug and chug thing, and that's really cool. But not everyone's going to be in a position maybe to get some of these. Um, or you just want to try it out, see if you even like it. You know, many of you are going to be starting with these kind of, you know, no frills options. And, uh, you know, that, that's fine. You know, people will get out 
on their soapboxes about why you shouldn't do that. But uh, it is an option. And, uh, you know, there's something you said about economics. Um, for me personally, it's not just about economics either. It's, it's also kind of feasibility. You know, I've played around with these pneumatics and I certainly like them and it is great to be accurate. But, you know, just as far as how quickly you can put them on and off during a workout, you know, sometimes I want to quickly go to a set and I don't necessarily want to have to throw this thing on and change the settings again or, you know, have to start it again. Or maybe I'm having issues pairing it with my Bluetooth for whatever reason, um, you know, because Bluetooth pairing leaves a bit to be desired. And, and most of these do work on Bluetooth. So these aren't without their shortcomings as well. So as great as they are, I would say that uh, sometimes it's nice to just have a cuff you can throw on. I've basically gotten myself to a point where, um, and sorry about this tangent, by the way, but I think this is relevant. I've gotten myself to a point to where I feel like I can simulate pretty well what I know to be my, uh, you know, appropriate amount of limb occlusion pressure with one of these um, because I've experimented with it. Now, if it's your first time using that, you're not one of these things, you're not necessarily going to be able to do that, which is why sometimes I think these pneumatics can be helpful to at least kind of get you started. Um, but again, there are some different ways to determine it if you're uh, not in, in a place, you know, budgetary wise to get one of these. So I'm going to just show you guys this no frills thing. So you put this thing on and you'd want to know, well, what's my, my limb occlusion pressure? Well, in order to determine that, you have to basically get yourself to a point where you're, you're ischemic, essentially. In other words, you don't necessarily have any blood flow, uh, arterial blood flow um, going through the limb. And one way that you're going to know that is you're actually going to stop your pulse. Now, you could actually monitor that with your fingers. You don't want to use your thumb because it has its own pulse on this hand. You can monitor your own pulse if you wanted to. They talk about using a stethoscope, but again, if you're in a gym, music, all that kind of thing going on, I don't think the stethoscope's that great. Um, they talk about using a Doppler, which is, you know, kind of a little, almost like an ultrasound device, uh, effectively. And uh, you can put a Doppler on, um, you know, again, once you start adding in the price of, you know, getting something like this, you're adding Dopplers and, you know, it starts getting expensive. Plus, it's not to say you have to be super adept to use a Doppler. It's just that it's kind of a pain and a nuisance. And unless you're that kind of like, you know, techie kind of person that likes to fidget around with that kind of stuff, I think a Doppler is just kind of a pain. So I typically don't, don't recommend people use Dopplers. Um, there is a cool thing you put on your finger. They're, they're really inexpensive called the pulse socks. Um, I have one. I just couldn't find it uh, for whatever reason. It seemed to have ran away on me. But you put this thing called on your finger called a pulse ox, and it just tells you what your oxygen saturation is. And uh, once you uh, have reached ischemia, you're going to see all of a sudden that pulse goes away or even it starts to kind of get, get faint and it's just kind of having a hard time reading it. That's kind of right about where you're going to be getting ischemic. And so let's just say in theory, you start to notice that, okay, you know, around 100 and say 80 ish is where you're you know that number might be for somebody right and uh, you're going to know that if you had an inflatable you know blood pressure cuff for instance so that's the other thing i didn't mention is if you have an inflatable blood pressure cuff um that's going to give you an idea of you know when that pulse stops okay it's around 180 that's how you know where you're going to become ischemic so all that being said you do need some different gizmos uh, unfortunately to know what your uh, occlusion is so uh you know i'll let you do with that what you will um, for those of you who are really looking to just kind of do the bare bones, get this thing started right out of the gate, there is something you can use kind of called perceived pressure, which is a 7 out of 10. So if 10 out of 10 is this is the most pressure I could conceivably tolerate, and a 0 would be no pressure, a 7 would be, you know, somewhere kind of skewed toward that 10, you know, a little more than a 5, but definitely not a 10. And so you can kind of make your best guess. That actually has been shown. Uh, it has been validated from what I uh, remember reading. So if you think about, okay, this is about a seven-ish out of 10 pressure, that's kind of a rough way to go off of it. And I think that's not a bad starting point for somebody who's fairly in tune with their body. Now, if you're not really, you know, you don't have a long exercise history, well, partly you probably shouldn't really be doing this in the first place. You know, this is, I think, probably a little bit better for somebody, at least in the performance enhancement aspect. If you're really trying to, you know, get those extra gains, I would say it helps to be in tune with your body. So you can kind of differentiate, you know, What's kind of that good hurt of, I know this is like exercise stuff versus what's like, maybe this is a problem kind of feeling. And, you know, if you've exercised for a while, well, you know what at least the good hurt feels like. So you can kind of differentiate a little bit more of, okay, this isn't, this isn't a really a good sensation versus somebody who's a complete newbie. Well, it's all kind of new sensations and you don't really know what's what. So if you're a newbie, I'd say air probably even maybe to like a six, you could probably even go a little bit lower just to be on the safe side. And that kind of brings up the next conversation, which is, you know, what's the safety on this thing? And I don't want to go on too much of a tangent because we haven't talked completely about limb occlusion pressure yet. But the good news is these things have been shown to be very safe. So for all those contraindications, um, this thing actually doesn't seem to be very dangerous at all. It doesn't actually seem to contribute to DVTs very much. Uh, there have been a few case reports, I think, in the literature. Uh, I know there was one with a girl, um, and I think she was, you know, doing kind of a protocol where she was doing something like every day and, and kind of going nuts with it. So it seems like if you do it sensibly, 
you know, typically with these cuffs, you only want to have them on maybe about 10 ish minutes. Um, say for like, you know, an exercise, if you're doing like four sets, say you leave it on for about, you know, five to 10 minutes, take it off for a little while, maybe like three minutes to let yourself kind of reperfuse. And then you can put it on again for 10 minutes. And within a session, you can probably go up to like 20, 30 ish minutes. 20 minutes is probably more, 15, 20 is kind of more what uh, studies have shown. Um, anecdotally, I've talked to people who've done it for 30 and seemingly they've been fine. Um, but you probably don't want to go too much beyond that mark. And I think if you let yourself reperfuse intermittently, you know, it should be a pretty sensible, all considered pretty safe way to do it. There, there was this thing called a Thompson test and, uh, you know, it's a DVT test, but it's not very reliable. So it's like, if you have this deep ache in your calf and you squeeze it, it's supposed to tell you if you have a DVT. Um, there's better ways to determine if you have a DVT, you know, you'd have to get an ultrasound scan to, to kind of really rule that out. Um, but you know, all considered DVTs are not a high risk with, uh, with BFR and that's uh, been borne out in many studies. So it isn't to say that, you know, everything is with, with risks, you know, certainly even you know, electrical stimulation, which, you know, many modalities, uh, if you actually read all the contraindications, they're certainly there as well. So BFR all considered, seems to be pretty safe. Uh, getting back to limb occlusion pressure. Sorry, I haven't completely uh, finished this yet. Uh, with limb occlusion pressure, once you've figured out what it is, okay, so whether you've got, you know, the blood pressure cuff on there and you've used the pulse ox to figure out, okay, I'm, I'm getting, you know, that ischemic point at about 180, then you have to figure out, okay, well, what do I want to train at now, right? And so that's basically that limb occlusion pressure thing is what percentage of that ischemic number am I going to train at? And in the upper extremity, 50-ish percent seems to be a pretty good sweet spot, okay? So if I'm 180 when I'm ischemic, then the training pressure I would want to be at would be about 50% of that, so let's just say 90, okay? So 90 is how much, you know, millimeters of mercury I'm going to want to train at when I'm doing upper body exercise, you know, BFR. In the lower extremity, it's a little bit higher. We can tolerate a bit more. It's kind of more in that 60 to 80 window, okay? So same thing again. If I were to notice I become ischemic at about 180, you know, I would take 60 to 80 percent of that and again when in doubt and certainly if you're if you're training somebody who's newer on this you're going to probably want to start lower just because it is pretty uncomfortable if you're doing this correctly um so it's it's not going to be you know the most comfortable sensation in the world uh because it's almost like that extreme feeling of like having that muscle pump you really get that metabolite accumulation and so you do feel that that burn that pump you know kind of feeling uh more so than you would feel without this and so it does get pretty uncomfortable so i'd say when in doubt uh, start a little lower in the limb occlusion pressure but again, that's about 50% on the upper arm, about 60 to 80 on the uh, on the lower limb. And so uh, that's the limb occlusion pressure in a nutshell. Now, all that being said, you can really simplify all that stuff dramatically by getting a newer cuff, one of these pneumatic ones. You know, I uh, haven't tried all the different models that are out there. There's plenty of them out there. Um, I got the one by Smart Cuffs just because it seemed like it was a little more plug and play and it had all the things that I wanted on it. And so I guess now would be about as good a time as any to talk about some of the different cuffs options and uh, why you might want to buy one versus another. So some of the things you're going to come across as you're, you're looking at bands is um, elastic, which is basically the stretchy material, kind of like a resistance band. Um, th there's more of the rigid style that don't really have that give. Yeah, it's more like a, like a strap. And then you have this pneumatic kind. So this is almost like a blood pressure cuff. It's inflatable. And so you slap this thing on your arm, you know, similarly to how you would put the other one on. And this thing is going to sync to an app on your phone with Bluetooth. So one of the coolest features about it too, though, is, I mean, there's a few things that are pretty cool about it. Um, you put this thing on and, you know, I'd put it on both limbs. And once you're, you know, it, it'll determine actually what that ischemic uh, point is. And then it'll help you to determine what your limb occlusion pressure is. So you don't have to worry about all the Doppler, you know, pulse oximeter, stethoscope stuff I was just talking about a minute ago. Um, so for those of you who are, you know, that was confusing or a little too much for you, you're not really the, the geeky, uh, you know, engineer type. Um, I would say you can simplify this dramatically. Now, I'm not trying to insult anybody, though. If you want to go down that road and don't really have the budget for these, certainly go down those other roads and, you, and you know, have at it. You can do all that stuff. And that's there for you. Um, but this is definitely, again, the, going to be the more simplistic way to do it. So you plug this thing in, you go through the app, and I'm not going to basically make this video about, you know, these smart cuffs. At some point, I might do an actual review on them. Um, for now, I'm just basically going to say that you take your, um, your cuff here, you know, you turn this thing on, it's going to, you know, sink, you know, left, right arm, and it's going to go through a little process. It's going to help you figure out your limb occlusion pressure. So one thing I should mention is you need to set these up before you actually plan to use them in a workout because that initial process does take a little bit of time. Um, and that ends up being probably one of the biggest drawbacks on these is that these pneumatic cuffs do take a little bit longer to get set up on. So, you know, if you're trying to get quickly from one exercise to another, you know, you're trying to reperfuse, you know, sometimes these things do get a little bit more cumbersome and they just take a little more time. So that's, that's the one, probably the biggest drawback with these. Uh, some of the cool features I liked though, is that, so this is a pneumatic cuff. 
It's also what's kind of known as a dynamic cuff, meaning that once it inflates to my limb occlusion pressure, which again, let's just say it's 90. So I, I was saying my ischemic point was, um, I get ischemic at 180. And then, so my, I'm gonna train 50% of that, which is 90, okay? For those of you who missed that earlier. Um, so I'm training at 90. So this thing is gonna keep me at 90. And the cool thing is, so normally some of the static ones would just bring this up to 90 and then you'd go about your workout. And then after a while, maybe it's gonna leak a little bit and all of a sudden it's at 65, but it hasn't done anything. Well, what this thing does is it actually communicates and with the, uh, the app on your phone. And so it's gonna keep this thing dialed in at 90, supposedly. Now, sometimes I've had some issues with my Bluetooth connection and it hasn't done that. But in theory, that's what it does. And it does actually a pretty good job overall with that. So it'll keep me at 90 for the duration I have it on if I'm, I'm using the continuous setting where I basically just keep it on. Now, there's also an intermittent setting as well, um, but I'm not going to get into that now. So with a dynamic cuff, it's going to keep you at that number and it's going to continue to keep you at that number over, you know, that course of how long you're using it versus static. You know, it's going to get it up to that point, but then you might be dropping off over the course of the workout. So dynamic tends to be a little bit better than static. Um, the other one, you know, this isn't as much of an issue anymore. It used to be, a, should I get an automatic versus a manual? They used to have manual ones you would have to inflate manually. Luckily, these ones, you know, these days, um, automatics are more popular. So I would say just go with the automatic. It just kind of inflates on its own. And so you're basically not having to worry about a lot of the things that people used to worry about in the earlier days of BFR. Um, they're getting a lot simpler now to use. And so I really like the, the fact that you can just kind of plug and play on these and again, with the exception of, you know, just different Bluetooth connectivity issues you might have, but that's pretty much true of, of any Bluetooth device. So overall, um, I like these smart cuff ones. You're going to probably notice this is a bit thicker too. So, you know, compared to those BFRs, this one's about two-ish inches. This is probably more like three, maybe even a little more than three. And the reason why um, you're going to want a, a bigger, you know, thicker one in general is because they're more comfortable. So it's kind of like when somebody steps on your toe with a high heel versus a, a shoe. Uh, you know, it's a more concentrated pressure, and that's why the high heel hurts so much more. So when you have just a thin band, you've got to get to higher pressure on that thinner band to get to that ischemic point or to that limb occlusion pressure point versus a broader one. The broader one is just going to be more comfortable. And if it's more comfortable, then, you know, as long as it's not so huge, it's actually blocking you because obviously range of motion wise, you don't want something restricting you if it's too big. So it's kind of a, a delicate balance of, of not being too restricted, but also not being, you know, digging into you and just being too uncomfortable. So I think they did a pretty good job with the sweet spot. I'd say this one might be a little bit wider than I would like ideally, whereas I've actually kind of liked more of this two-ish, you know, maybe a little wider here could have been okay. Um, so something probably in between to me personally would have been the sweet spot. But that again, personal preference is no one's going to get it right for everybody. Um, but in general, I think that they did a pretty good job here having this broader cuff just because again, it is more comfortable and that would certainly be true in the thigh. One thing I should mention with these is, you know, a cool thing about this, again, being plug and play is you can easily adjust this for the thigh as well as the arm versus with smart cuffs, you also do need a separate one for the thigh. So the cost ends up, uh, you know, going up pretty quickly on these once you start to have to get two arm units and two leg units. So, you know, again, I know that it, that might be pro cost prohibitive for many of you. So if you're not going to be able to get one with all the bells and whistles, again, I would say just figure out if you like using one of these in the first place. You can do the earlier stuff, you know, pull socks with a blood pressure cuff, figure out what your... Uh, you know, limb occlusion pressure is, you know, slap this guy on, see if you can at least get that kind of seven out of 10 feeling. And, you know, overall, you should be doing yourself a pretty good, good justice as long as you keep those things in mind. Um, another method I didn't mention earlier, capillary refill is one of those things you can sometimes check too. And so when you, you push into yourself and then you, you let go, you know, you should be able to get that stack in about three-ish seconds or so. We tend to call that capillary refill. And so that's one way you can tell if you're, you've got this thing cranked up too high. You know, if, if it takes more than three seconds to get that reperfusion, and that's, uh, that's pretty much a no-no. So you want to make sure you're keeping your capillary refill within three seconds. So you, again, you, 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 know, you put your finger down, take it away, you should get that back pretty readily. Um, one thing you also you should, know, should probably keep in mind here with these cuffs, you know, with this one, you're going to want to cinch that down tight right away and get that 7 out of 10. Whereas here, I'm not going to get 7 out of 10 when I just strap it on. The 7 out of 10 comes after I've, I've used the app to get this up to, to 90 you know, millimeters of mercury, for instance, if that's what I'm doing. So when I start out, I should have this thing on somewhat loosely. You know, they usually say you can get a couple of fingers in here. And I think that's a pretty good policy. You should be able to get, you know, have a little space in here. You shouldn't have it, you know, ratcheted down super tight before you've even turned it on the, uh, synced it up with the app and got the uh, limb occlusion pressure that this thing's determined you should be at. And then one last thing I should mention about limb occlusion pressure, if you want to delve into the literature on this, the most reliable way, and again, the way that studies are often done is different than how real life works in many regards. And that's not to knock researchers, it's just to say that, you know, you have to standardize things in a lab. 
versus in real life, you don't necessarily have to uh, do that so so much. And so in real life, you can kind of do what's you know practical as long as it's sensible. Um, but that being said, in the uh, literature, you'll see they lay down to determine people's limb occlusion pressure a lot versus, you know, if you want to just determine what your limb occlusion pressure is standing up, I don't think that's as big of a deal. And, and here's my rationale for it. You know, when you're laying down, your blood pressure tends to be a little bit higher. And so if, you're, if your blood pressure tends to be a little bit higher, when you're determining your limb occlusion pressure, you're going to need a little bit higher limb occlusion pressure as well. And so if you're upright, you know, our blood pressure tends to be a little bit lower when we're upright. You know, one of the reasons why people who have what's known as orthostatic hypotension, which is, in other words, their blood pressure drops too much when they get up. You know, everyone's blood pressure drops a little bit initially when they get up, but then your body should normalize that pretty quickly. But in other people, it just, it just drops and, and tanks too readily, and sometimes they get dizzy and even pass out. If you take your limb occlusion pressure standing up, you're going to probably end up coming in a little bit of a lower pressure. But because of the fact you're doing most of your exercises and your workouts standing up, I think it's probably fine to do that that way. Um, I, I've done both. I've looked at my limb occlusion pressure laying down. I've looked at it standing up. And most of the time, I think standing up is fine. Um, that's how I've done it. And I haven't had any issues there. But you might hear from other people, no, you need to do it laying down. And for me, if you're going to end up using one of these to determine your limb occlusion pressure, I think you're probably fine to do it standing up. All right, so now we can go ahead and get to sort of the meat and potatoes, which are the treatment protocols. You know, how do I use this thing? Who do I use it for? You know, who should use this thing in general? What kinds of training are we talking about? Resistance exercise, aerobic training, you know, rehab-related applications. So I want to talk about all that stuff, um, but I also want to just briefly recap. So, you know, hopefully we just kind of gave a broad overview of what BFR is. You know, it's basically a way to just heighten the stimulus. Now, almost think of it as tricking your system into thinking you're using a higher load than you really are. So you're recruiting what's known as your, as your high threshold motor units a little bit earlier uh, by, by training a lower percentage. So, you know, BFR is mainly for low to moderate intensity. It's not for high intensity. So, you know, traditional hypertrophy workouts, you know, for, for those of you who don't aren't too familiar with this lingo, you know, one, one RM is basically a one rep max. So, you know, if I'm thinking about a bench press, so my one RM is the most amount of weight I can lift for one repetition. And so based on that number, you can, you can set rep ranges for, for certain goals. So if I'm, you know, purely looking at strength, you know, I'm typically staying, you know, upwards of 85%. If I'm looking at hypertrophy, I'm sometimes upwards of, you know, 60 to 80, somewhere in that neck of the woods, you know, oftentimes, you know, skewing closer to 70, 80%. Um, you know, again, different people will vary a little bit on some of these rep, you know, ranges, but that's, you know, overall where you're at. So, you know, 60% is pretty high though, right? So you know, let's just say to make the math really super easy here, the most I can bench press is going to be hundred pounds, right? So 60% of that would be 60 pounds. So 60 pounds, and then, you know, for that 60 pounds, let's just say I can do 8 to 12 repetitions, just, you know, to, again, to make the math easy. Um, well, again, you know, some people can't train, say I just had a pec tear, and, uh, you know, it's a pretty fresh injury. Well, I don't want to lift 60% of my max because maybe I'm going to re-injure that again. And so all of a sudden, I can put this BFR cuff on, and I can get a better training stimulus at a lower load. So instead of having to put 60 pounds on, if I'm only going to like 20 to 30 percent of one one rep max, I've only got 20 to 30 pounds on. I'm I'm barely lifting anything, and I'm getting myself a similar training effect, you know, in a way to what that that 60 percent would have given me. So that's a really cool feature of this BFR. Now you can get stronger also with BFR. You're not going to get probably as strong though. So if strength is really your goal, you know, I think with hypertrophy related applications is probably where where BFR shines even more. With strength, you know, particularly at the higher levels of strength. Um, it's probably not going to shine as much, but what it can do is it can get you there a little bit quicker potentially, right? So if you're not losing muscle cross-section area, in other words, you're not atrophying because, you know, after a, a bad, you know, say an ACL tear, you know, one of the, the hallmarks of that is you have a lot of atrophy in, in, in your quads, particularly the uh, inner head, you know, the teardrop, the vastus medius, uh, medialis oblique. Um, and so, you know, that BMO tends to, uh, to really atrophy. And so, you know, all of a sudden I put that BFR cuff on. And I can, I can attenuate or I can, I can really slow down that atrophy so that that muscle is essentially able to hit the ground running, so to speak, a lot earlier. I can rehab that person a lot faster in theory. And that's kind of how, that, how that's been borne out in literature. And it's actually been shown to do a pretty good job at that. Um, so that's how BFR can work. Um, you know, basically, you know, so it's, it's more for that low to moderate uh, amount of resistance. And so that's been shown to be effective with resistance training. It's also been shown to be effective with aerobic training. And then, um, you know, again, rehab-related applications that I kind of just alluded to now. And so how long do you want to typically have this on? I kind of spoke to that a little bit earlier in the video. Um, five to 10 minutes is probably pretty good for, for your first kind of, you know, go at it. So, you know, you put this thing on and, you know, again, five to 10 minutes, you know, might get me, you know, if I'm doing a superset, for instance, I could probably do a superset of my first pairing in, in five to 10 minutes. 
and then uh, I take it off, maybe let it reperfuse for say three-ish minutes, and then I might put it on again. Now, one thing you want to also keep in mind is it really depends on what your goal is. So let's just say you don't have an injury and you, you want to kind of get, you know, the best of both worlds. You, you want to get, you know, stronger and you want to get stronger optimally, but you also really want to tap into some hypertrophy gains as well. But what I would typically have a person like that do, and, and often the way I'll use it in my own training, because as I mentioned a minute ago, you know, usually with this, you want to probably have it on 15, 20 minutes. You know, if you're pretty advanced and you're, you're pretty in tune with your body and you've been using it for a while, um, it seems like you might be able to go up a little bit higher, you know, 30 minutes. Um, the research hasn't entirely shown that to be the case, but it seems like it works for about that a period of time. Um, but if your workout's going to be closer to an hour, what I typically will do is I'll start my workouts initially uh, without the BFR. And so I can really try to recruit my high threshold motor units, really work my strength because I'm not limited by BFR. Because the other thing is, if I put a BFR cuff on and I, I tried to do a, you know, high intensity training, it's probably going to compromise my, my workout a little bit, right? So normally if I, you know, my one rep max, let's just say again, was hundred pounds and uh, I put 60 pounds on the bar and I was trying to hit 12, but with that BFR cuff on, you know, I'm not going to be able to lift nearly as much. And so that, that's going to, that's why it might inhibit the, the maximum strength benefit a little bit. And so what I can do to kind of get the best of both worlds is start the workout, you know, get that strength that I'm shooting for. And then as the workout's going to start to kind of, you know, wind down anyways, because muscle fatigue is accumulating, you know, so then all of a sudden I'm going to, so let's just say I'm going to do an hour long workout. The first 30 minutes or so I'm without BFR. And then the second half of it, all of a sudden I put the BFR into the mixture. So that's a pretty cool way to do it. And, you know, some people might say, you know, do BFR earlier, take it off and then put it on again. You know, you, you can stagger it different ways like that too. Um, personally, my own experience, I like kind of doing the 50-50 approach the best though, where I kind of start the workout without the BFR and then BFR comes in kind of later towards the game because later in the game is when I like to typically do higher volume hypertrophy style workouts anyways, or I like to do kind of more, you know, what I like to call burnouts where you're kind of going to failure. And one thing I didn't mention about BFR is going to failure does seem to be helpful. So that, that's another debate in, into itself. You know, should people go to failure in general, even without BFR or not? Um, it seems to be effective just because you know that you're getting as many motor units as possible. You know, there's this whole idea of leaving a little bit in the tank, right? So, you know, if, if I was going to go to, you know, max reps such as I could get 12, um, but let's just say I'll, all of a sudden, you know, 12 would be my absolute max, but here I am on, on rep number 10. I probably feel like I can do maybe one or two more, and that's where I'm going to go ahead and stop. I'm going to stop at that point where I have kind of one or two more in the tank, and, and some people can train that way. And certainly you can still tap into hypertrophy, you know, increasing muscle size without going to failure. And, and research has shown that, you know, one of the hard things with, with literature um, is that, you know, a lot of the recruits are, are young college age males who maybe have, they've, they've worked out a little bit, but they're not, they're not typically advanced. And so it's really hard to get good advanced subjects for, for studies. And it's hard to kind of show, you know, because advanced trainees tend to need higher volume typically. And so I think with the advanced trainees, because, you know, they really need every little inch they can get to, to inch out that extra hypertrophy, right? Because, you know, for a novice, they can pretty much do anything and they're going to get great gains in the gym because their body is just so aversion to the whole experience of weight training versus, you know, the, the, the more, it's kind of like one of those saturation curves, you know, where the, the, the fitter you get, the more you're, you're kind of fighting for, you know, smaller and smaller incremental amounts. That's part of the reason why, you know, if you're a track and field athlete, you know, you can shave a lot of time off your, uh, you know, 100 yard dash, you know, from one time to the next, if you're just starting versus when you've been doing track and field for 10 years, you know, you're, you're fighting for, for tens of seconds there, you know, because it gets harder and harder to make that progress, the more advanced that you get. And so I think for an advanced trainee, going to failure is probably a good thing. And particularly going to failure with this BFR, because you're already using a, a lesser load, really what you are going for is you want to try to accumulate as many metabolites as you can in that area. And so why not, you know, just go to failure, at least on the last set. And so maybe, you know, if I'm doing three or four sets, uh, which again, typically is going to be more beneficial than one to two, if I'm advanced, um, you know, on that last set, I'm going to probably just try to give it all I have, you know, safely, of course. So obviously if I'm, I'm throwing a lot of body English into it and I'm, you know, having to really, you know, uh, inch out that, you know, that grind that rep out and I'm compromising form. You know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking more like technical failure. What's the last one I can do with, with pretty decent form? You know, I'm going to probably go to failure at least at that point. And, uh, you know, we can talk about force reps and all that stuff too. But uh, all that being said, I think BFR to failure is a pretty effective way to go. And so what I'll typically do as my workout goes on is I'll do, you know, go to failure at least on the last set of my exercise. And that's when I'll try to throw BFR into the mixture just to try to really get all I can Kind of on that hypertrophy front, front towards the end of the workout. Now that being said, that's all resistance training stuff. 
Uh, BFR has also been shown to be effective when it comes to aerobic exercise as well. So with aerobic training, all the benefits to be had with aerobics, you can think of, you know, pretty much you can exploit also with BFR. It seems to be a pretty good match for people who are looking to increase their aerobic capacity, try to increase aerobic endurance, that type of thing also. And so the way you would typically do that, you know, most traditional training modalities for aerobic training are, uh, are for the lower extremity. So you think about something like a stationary bicycle, for instance, you know, you would slap this thing on again, same place as we talked about earlier, you know, just below that great, greater troke, you know, closer to the uh, kind of groin area, if you can get it there, somewhere between 60 and 80 limb occlusion pressure. So you slap this guy on and then you would probably try and do that somewhere around 20 minutes. Again, you probably could go up to that 30 minute mark. So, you know, one of the things you wouldn't do with this is probably go for that long workout, right? So if you're trying to do a century ride, you know, you're not going to necessarily want to have this on for four hours. So you know, this probably lends itself a little bit better to interval style training rather than that kind of low steady state. Although there have been some studies that have shown even just slapping this thing on walking and quite frankly, even at rest. Now, if you're a high level athlete, you know, putting this thing on at rest may not do a lot for you, perhaps when it comes to uh, recovery, if you're going to that ischemic point, and I'm not going to talk about, you know, PIC in this video, but in another video, I probably will cover that. Um, BFR though, you might be able to use for somebody who's really low level in, in a hospital type setting to try to increase hypertrophy. But if you're that aerobic endurance athlete and you're basically trying to just do an interval style workout, that's when I would probably tell somebody to go ahead and slap on a BFR cuff. If you're going to do one of your lower steady state workouts where you're, you know, you're going to go for a long time, um, you know, you could put on BFR for part of that workout if you wanted to. I would say it's probably up to you to experiment with that because again, BFR, you kind of get cap it out around that 20, 30 minute mark and you're not going to be able to put it on for, for the whole duration of the workout. So for that reason, I think it's probably more going to lend itself to intervals. All right, so now we can talk about a few rehab related applications. I kind of already alluded to a few, but basically the idea is if anyone can't tolerate load, I would think in my mind, at least, they're going to potentially be a good candidate for BFR, assuming that all those contraindications, obviously, that we spoke to in the beginning of the video um, are, are not applicable to them. So, you know, it's not to say that those people who have those contraindications could never do BFR, but you certainly would want to get them cleared, make sure at least their medical team feels good about getting on board with this and giving it a try, and, and certainly that the patient feels good about it. You know, it just, all, again, always depends on where people's risk aversion tolerance is. Um, but if there was somebody who, you know, really had, you know, a strong need to overcome some atrophy, somebody that I can maybe try to heighten, you know, their return to function a little bit earlier with BFR, you know, to me, they would be a good candidate for it. So there's actually um, a form of ischemic, essentially BFR, which they tend to call uh, PIC or PCI, I can't remember which one goes where. Uh, I'll do a video perhaps on, on that at some point. Um, but even at bed rest, there seems to be some benefit with this stuff. So if you're looking to really minimize atrophy, um, it seems to do something for us that's pretty favorable. And so again, you know, the, the most obvious candidates are like the ACL tears. Those are the people who cannot tolerate load. Um, and so for that reason, you know, anything I can do to try to heighten those anabolic signals to try to keep the muscle mass they have and then see if I can return them to function a little bit quicker, that's certainly something you're going to want to try to exploit. Uh, tendinopathies are where the, the BFR maybe doesn't shine as much because we know tendons do need high load, particularly those, those high eccentric loads. And so BFR maybe doesn't shine as much there. But again, no reason why you couldn't do kind of a hybrid style training session. So the you know, important thing, and, and hopefully what you might have gleaned from this channel for those of you who've seen some other videos, is it doesn't always have to be an all or none type of thing. So there's no reason why you couldn't still do some heavy eccentrics on, on a person who had a tendinopathy and then also add in BB, BFR perhaps as a supplement to that. So I think there could be some benefit to be had by having extra metabolites in that area as well. And one of the things we tend to know about connective tissue, ligaments, you know, cartilage, even to extent uh, tendons, you know, they're more avascular. They don't tend to have a good blood supply. Their metabolic activity is lower, and so they don't tend to heal as fast. So anything that you can do to potentially bring more metabolites in that area or leave them there longer, to me, at least in theory, has some backing that maybe that could be a good thing. And so that's where I think BFR can be applicable. And so again, maybe that person with a tendinopathy, say an Achilles tear or something of that nature, um, I might try to use BFR for them. Um, Achilles tendinopathy, when we say tendinopathy, we can talk about tendinosis versus tendinitis. And tendinitis is more that acute thing versus tendinopathy. That's kind of what I'm talking about, where it's, it's been a long standing itis and you've got remodeling of that tendon in unfavorable ways and that person's just not doing very good. Um, that's where, you know, again, literature hasn't really shown the benefits of BFR yet, but I think if there was a hybrid study that showed, you know, the eccentric component with BFR, that's where maybe we might be able to get some of that. Um, rotator cuff, you know, one of the things I didn't mention so much about BFR is there seems to be a little bit of a systemic benefit as well as maybe a benefit proximally. So, you know, we know with the upper arm cuff, you know, we can only put it up about as high as, 
you know, kind of where that crease goes, right? So, you know, again, where that deltoid tuberosity-ish area was, um, I can't go much higher than that, right? So in theory, I guess I could put this cuff up here, but it would be pretty awkward. It really wouldn't work. So unfortunately, if I had like a rotator cuff thing going on, the benefits tend to be more, most pronounced distally, meaning below where I'm including. But there does seem to be some benefit proximally as well. It hasn't really shown to be extremely effective yet with like rotator cuff issues, but there may be some extra benefit to be had with BFR. So again, if I had somebody who, you know, the good news is with, with BFR, it's pretty safe. So if you had somebody who had a rotator cuff repair, because initially you're starting them out at, at such low loads uh, anyways to protect that repair, I don't really see any harm in maybe at least trying to slap some BFR on them and see if it might help a little bit. Um, assuming, of course, the patient's on board with that. But if you get these people, and, and I've had plenty, and, and many people are this way, where you know any little thing they can do to get better, they want to do it because they want to be better as fast as possible. And anyone who's had a rotator cuff tear you know, can probably attest to the fact that in the beginning, it really sucks because you're just so limited as far as what you can do. So if there's anything that can potentially get you back a little bit quicker, I think that's a possibly you know a, a modality worth exploring. And so BFR might be able to do that for you. Certainly, we know that working your good side has benefits as well. So that's, that's something you probably want to be doing also. Um, but all that being said, you know, BFR, so proximal benefits, I would say probably anybody who can't tolerate load. Um, there, had, there was a study, I think, even showing that somebody that uh, it was shown to be safe in people who had MS. So we talk about, you know, think about neurological populations. You know, should I use this on somebody with a, with a condition like Parkinson's disease? You know, I think the jury is probably still out on that. Um, although with Parkinson's disease, we certainly do know that they are susceptible to muscle atrophy and weakness, right? And so we know part of what uh, contributes to balance is, is strength, right? Just getting somebody stronger uh, without even touching their balance is going to potentially improve their, their, reduce their fall risk. And so if I can use BFR maybe to get somebody a little bit stronger more quickly, perhaps that can be something to reduce somebody's fall risk. Again, that we haven't seen a study that, that's looked at that yet, but in theory, at least there might be some backing there. So, um, you know, my candidates for rehab with BFR are, are pretty far and wide. Um, I would say a lot of people could be a, a good candidate for this. Certainly, though, some people are not going to be good candidates for this. And, and ultimately, you know, I think the most important variable probably is, uh, is, is something the patient even wants to do, right? Because some patients just, you know, they're not going to be comfortable with it. They're just not going to be appropriate for it for various reasons, you know, psychologically, emotionally, whatever it is. Um, so it's not like to say this is something you have to throw on everybody. Uh, but I think for those people who are interested in really maximizing their benefits, uh, there's a lot of people you can probably put this on. So uh, BFR for the win, for me, I think that's probably one of the more um, exciting things that's come along, uh, which, ha which again, is not, is not that new. It has been around for a little while. What I'm really excited about, though, is just that the cuffs are getting a lot better. So again, with this smart cuff, um, it's great because it's, it's dynamic. Uh, so it pumps up. You know, it tells you what your limb occlusion pressure is. It tells you a lot of the things. So it takes a lot of the, the guesswork out of it. It just takes a lot of the hassle out of it, too, which I think for many people, you know, the more barriers you can remove, uh, the easier it's going to be implemented, more people are going to get on board with it. So um, I like these, again, nomadics, but again, they are more expensive. So, you know, it's one of those things, too, where you just have to determine, you know, what's in your budget. But regardless, the cool thing is, you know, whether your budget isn't that high, um, th there's still some some entry points for you. So, and again, these BFR bands are not very expensive at all. I think this is like 15 bucks. Um, so potentially all you need is 15 bucks. And then once you know that, okay, I need to be at about a 7 out of 10 on my pressure scale, you know, I think it's probably a, a decent starting point for somebody who's pretty in tune with their body. But uh, when in doubt, you know, and, and if you, you have the budget for the better ones, you know, obviously that's probably a, a good way to go. Um, but all that said, that's BFR for today. Hopefully that wasn't too uh, long and boring for you. Hopefully that gives you enough to go off of to at least kind of get started. Um, I know we kind of delved into limb occlusion pressure probably a little longer than we should have. Um, at some point, though, if there's any specific questions about this stuff, I might upload some shorter videos where I specifically show how to determine these things just kind of as a supplement to this. And I do want to talk about some other ways that they've been using ischemic techniques to increase uh, not necessarily performance so much, but recovery or at least attenuate muscle atrophy. So I'll be talking about that at some point as well. Uh, more good content always, as always in the pipeline. Uh, videos coming up. I need to re-upload uh, a few other videos that had some poor audio quality. So some of that's going to be coming up. I also want to talk about a few updates I have on, on some low back pain stuff that I've, uh, you know, I feel like is kind of a little better than the uh, initial video that I had. So at some point in the near future, I am going to uh, speak to back pain again, because certainly that's something that 80% of Americans have and uh, does not seem to be going away. So I want to talk about back pain, what you can do about it. So please stay tuned, subscribe if you like this stuff. I hope you guys learned uh, something today. And as always, hope you have some fun.